Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, uh, the, I guess the topic today, of course, is going to be geotechnical considerations uh, in design and construction of bridges. Uh, Textile is building a lot of bridges. We have about 120 people have RSVP'd. Uh, I'm pretty, pretty sure there's going to be a lot of engineers in there. Uh, if you need to reach me, my email is de at geoteching.com. My phone number is 713-699-4000. This program is on YouTube, so anybody wants to go out there and watch it, they can watch it on YouTube. Uh, they got to search geotech engineering and testing, and uh, that we'll put all these presentations on YouTube so that the public can 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 use it, watch it. And uh, I work with geotech engineering and testing. We work in Houston. We work all over Texas. Actually, we're located in Houston. We've been around for about 36 years. We do geotechnical environmental material testing. We've got 60 people, and we have all rigs. Uh, like Mike said, if you have any questions, go to the Q&A section out there on your panel. We're going to be talking about bridges. The biggest bridge that we have in the Houston area right now is the Houston Ship Channel Bridge that Harris County Toro Authority is putting together. It's a billion dollar project, uh, really an interesting bridge. Uh, very nice. Of course, the whole Texas, we have all kinds of bridges in Texas and uh, overpasses and uh, it's really interesting. We've got smaller bridges supported on drill piers or piling, subdivision bridges, overpasses. This is a bridge in the woodlands uh, north of Houston. Uh, pedestrian bridges. A lot of these pedestrian bridges are sitting on spread footings or, or drill piers. My major project, State Highway 99 bridge. There's a hairline crack and separation breaking up of a, a bridge. Here's another picture of that, kind of a heavy load. Here's another bridge failure. This is a Pittsburgh bridge failure. That was a kind of happened in 2022. A lot of snow there. You can see the whole bridge just collapsed. Yeah, you can see the, it's a real mess. Pittsburgh bridge failure due to inadequate load carrying capacity. I don't know. That's what they said on Google. Minneapolis bridge uh, collapse, 2007. This one was really bad. You can see uh, how bad this looks like. Lots of cars in the water. This bridge failed due to design flaw. That's what said on the Google. Textile bridge failure, I-10 at San Jacinto River. A barge hit this thing and uh, just crushed the columns. And they're gonna re rebuild this bridge and have a lot of protection for their columns due to barge traffic. Um, if you do the, the sonar on this thing here, you can see the, the barge hit the column here and just bend the column right there and just crack it to pieces. This one seems okay. This column seems okay. Here's another bridge failure column failure. Yeah, kind of interesting. All right, so if you're doing a bridge, some of the basics the stuff that we have to do from a geotechnical standpoint are get out there and do drilling and sampling. These are our rigs in here. This rig can go up to 150 feet deep. This goes 150. These things can go 20 feet deep. 
these rigs can go, this rig can go about 30 feet deep. You need traffic control on a lot of these projects. Should be done in accordance with Texas Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices. You do a boring out here with a drill rig out there at the end of the bridge, right there on one side of the embankment. You can see how that how the boring is done. Sometimes you do boring at the toe. The, the soils at the toe of the slope uh, underneath the bridge, a lot of times is different than at the top because of a lot of siltation. You're gonna find a lot of silt and sand at the bottom. Here you might find a lot of clays. So that's why we recommend to put borings at the toe as well to help run slope stability when you do bridge embankments. That's a portable rig going in there doing a boring at the toe. Again, here's a bridge doing a boring out there for it. It's a pedestrian bridge there. We need buggy sometimes on projects because some of these grounds are real soft. So to build, build, build a bridge here, we have to use what's called swarm buggy rig. Here's another bridge boring out here for Hectra, Harris County Toro Authority. There's another one. Again, here's the Harris County, this is the toll road, the tech stop toll road around Houston, State Highway 99, this is the rig. It's a water, water truck. A lot of times when you do borings, you may have to do coring to remove the concrete and then do borings through the hole here. Use the concrete thickness. It's the boring location. Some of these areas, they got asphalt overlay over concrete. Here's the asphalt paving over a stabilized subgrade. You cover it so that the people do not step into it. Cover the hole. After you drill and get your sampling done, uh, you do grouting. This is a mix of cement and bentonite. You mix it together, cement and bentonite, and you pump it from bottom up into the hole. You grout it. That way you just don't have a hole there anymore. And uh, a lot of times the hole collapses anyway. So, but you grab where you, what you can. You make sure the grout the plug stays in there. You probe it, make sure it stays in there. Here's the buggy rigs again. If the area is real soft and muddy, you're gonna have to use buggy to do your borings. This is a, again, this is another buggy. If you're in the water, you're doing a bridge over water like a stream or a lake or a causeway. Uh, you got to get out there and with a barge, you put a rig on top of the barge with a moon pool. And here's a barge with a rig on it. You got a moon pool here. Here's the boring you do in the water. It's the Houston Ship Channel. And see like that. Water go all the way down to 100, 120 feet deep. If the area is wooded, then you have to do some partial clearing, clear the path for the rig to go out there and, and get the borings done. Most of the sampling is done with what's called a Shelby tube sample. These are three inch diameter tube samples. They're hollow. You push them hydraulically to the soil. That's what the soil sample looks like when it comes out. One of the things that you measure over there is the root fibers. It's very important to know what your root fibers are in your soils. That tells you the depth of active zone. So active zone varies across Texas and it has to do with the climatic conditions. This is the zone experiences shrink swell problems. And usually the active zone is two feet below the lowest root fiber. This is a root fiber six to eight feet. This is uh, eight to 10 feet. We find root fibers all the way up to 20 feet in boom projects. In areas where we got sandy soils, we do a standard penetration test. This is a 140 pound hammer drop 30 inches. You drive into the soil 18 inches. 
Again, this is a 140 pound hammer. Six inch, six inch, six inch. You drive it 18 inches into the ground. You disregard the, the first six inches and you get the blows for the two last six inches. That will be your SPT value. Standard penetration test, SPT, 140 pound hammer dropping 30 inches. It's a typical sand sample. You see the sand like that. If your blow counts to be zero to four, you got basically loose sands, very loose sands, five to 10, loose, medium dense, 11 to 30, dense, 31 to 50, and very dense over 50. Texas cone penetrometer. If you're doing a project for TxDOT, you got to use the TCP cone penetrometer device. That's how it looks like. You drive it into the soil, 12 inches, actually 12, 24 inches, 12 inches for seating and two six, six inch inches. Here's a cone right there. Here's the rig. You mark the rig, about 24 inches of penetration. So then when you run the TCP with 24 inches, 12 inch and 12 inch, I mean, I guess this is 12, 18, 24 inches. It's 170 pounds hammer, drop 24 inches. The seating is 12 inches and then six inch and six inch. The diameter of the cone is three inches in diameter. When you do TCP, if your blow counts is between zero to eight, you got very soft clays or very loose sands. In eight to 20 blow count, you got soft clays, loose sands. In 20 to 40, you got stiff clays and slightly compact sands. You call it like medium dense. In 40 to 80, very, very stiff and compact, what we call it very dense, you know, dense sand. In eight to five over 100, five inch over 100, it's hard and dense. Very dense is if you have zero to five inch per hundred. In sand and in clay, it's very hard. If you're in rock, if your blow counts is between zero to two inch over 100 blows, you got sandstone, chert, granite, you know, limestone. If it's one to five inches over 100, you have siltstone, iron deposit, most limestones, four to six inches over 100, gypsum, calcite, evaporite, chalk, maybe shale. Rock coring, if you start going deeper, you're going to hit rock. The rock in Houston is about 2,500 feet deep. You go out there in Dallas and San Antonio, you're going to hit rock on the surface some places, like especially San Antonio and Austin. You know, in Dallas, you know, a lot of times you got to go in places 20 feet or so. Maybe you hit the limestone. Some places you won't. It's all clay. You go to Las Colinas, you go clay all the way down. Uh, this is a kind of a limestone pouring. So log it. We cut the ends of the sample. And you put it in foil. Put a job number on it, pouring number. These are the uh, soil samples. Uh, you put it in a wax box. By the way, if anybody's got a question, go ahead and ask me as I'm going through it so that I can answer it. You don't have to wait all the way to the end. You know, I, I'll answer it as we go through that way. It's fresh on your mind. One of the things we do for bridges, we got to put piezometers in the ground. These are uh, PVC pipes that are perforated. These are perforations. You stick them in the embankment of the bridge. You know where the groundwater table is. You put them in the ground, drill a hole. You put them in the ground. You backfill around them with uh, bentonite and then, then grout above the bentonite to keep the surface water from penetrating. Then you can measure the water level inside the piezometer. The water level fluctuates seasonally. It depends on time of the year. If you get a lot of the rain, you have shallow water table. If you have no rain, you got deep water table. 
you backfill around the screens with sand to allow the water to flow through the PVC pipe. So, and, and then you put bentonite around it. This is the bentonite pallets. This is a piezometer. You cap it. That's a piezometer, P3. That's another piezometer. You got bentonite around it. You put a tape measure in there, you measure the water level. You go out there and usually do it once a week for a couple of months just to see water fluctuations. The way you design a piezometer, you got the piezometer PVC pipe, usually about two to three inches in diameter. This is the screen. You put sand around the screen. Then you go over here a couple of feet above it, you put bentonite, and above that you grab it with cement so that the water doesn't come in. This is the Harris County flood control diagram. We have water tables that fluctuates. The regular groundwater table may be 20 feet. The way you measure water table, you put a tape measure with a weight at the end of it, you throw it in a hole. When it goes plunk, you measure water level. We do the geotechnical work around Houston area based on city Houston geote geotechnical guidelines, chapter 11. Or we use Harris County geotechnical guidelines that needs to be updated is 2011. Or Harris County flood control geotechnical guidelines. They got bridge section. That's 2021. It's a very good document. It's a good reading. If you want to read about geotechnical work, this is a good, uh, good document. TxDOT has got a guideline too. That's July 2020. Uh, so if you got a project that's controlled by TxDOT, you got to follow TxDOT standards. The required number of boring for bridges. You do one boring every 300 foot spacing. You know you stagger them. You know one here, 300 foot, 300 foot, 300 foot. You got double lanes. You know two way traffic here, 300 foot, 300 foot, 300 foot, 300 foot. And here's another scheme here. For roads, you do one boring typically, you know, uh, in, you know, in Texas and Houston, you do it every 500 foot spacing. The textile is different. Uh, I think it's like half a mile or a mile or something like that. If you got uh, salt, uh, uh, soils that are subject to sulfate, you got to do one boring every 500 foot. For retaining walls, you got to do one boring somewhere about, you know, uh, every 250 feet apart. And usually I bought these four feet below the uh, 12 of the embankment. If it's a big embankment, I may go down more than 40 feet. Ditches, I usually go about twice the height of the ditch. So if my ditch is 15 foot, I go 30 foot borings for slope stability. Same as detention pond, I go twice the height of the detention pond and minimum of five borings for a, you know, like a five acre detention pond and one boring for every additional five acres. For signs, I usually do a 30 foot borings. Sound walls, I usually do 30 foot borings. Um, let's see. Next dot has got sound walls that you need to come up with foundation for. Um, for small bridges, we go 80 foot below the channel bottom base. For the, so if your channel is 20 foot deep, the boring is going to be 100 foot. For pedestrian bridges, you go 40 foot below the bottom of the channel basin. For large bridge, bridges, depends on loading. You know, we do projects that, you know, we go 150 foot borings. And I wouldn't be surprised if you got projects where you go 200 foot space. We got a question. Uh, what would you want a three inch piezometer instead of two inch piezometer? Actually, this standard is three inch. A lot of people use three inch. We use two inch a lot of times too. It's easier to get the water level on a three inch than two inch. But if you got budget problems, access problems, or something like that, you use two inch PVC pipe. But the standard is pretty much a three inch PVC pipe. Laboratory testing here, it's some typical. Uh, laboratory tests. Uh, this is what's called liquid limit test. 
At this test, we try to figure out how much water we add to the soil for it to behave liquid. So we add water to the soil in this cup in here. And, uh, and when it gets really watery and all that, we take some of that sample, you put on this cup in here, you kind of grow, grow, kind of grow through, through it. And, uh, and we turn this handle 20 to 30 times. And uh, when this, this thing comes together, these cuts, and uh, you know, this is the groove cut, and you get a sample of it. This is the wet weight of the sample. You want to know how much water should, is in the soil for it to behave liquid. So you put it in there, and, and uh, uh, you get the, put it in the oven and dry it up, and you get a dry weight of it, and then, then that's how you measure how much water is in the soil for it to behave liquid. The other test we do in the lab is called plastic limit test. And this test, what we're trying to figure out how much water should be in the soil for it to behave semi-plastic with low moisture. And uh, this is a one eighth of an inch rolls. You get the wet weight of it. You put it in the oven and dry it up and you get the dry weight of it. Difference between liquid limit and plastic limit is plasticity index or plasticity index or PI. If your PI is less than 20, you got low soil potential for expansive soil. Between 20 and 30 is moderately expansive. 30 to 40 is highly expansive. Above 40 is very high. And we got a lot of expansive soils in Texas. A couple of other, te other tests that we do in the laboratory are hand penetrometer and tour main test. In the hand penetrometer test, we push this, uh, this device, the hand penetrometer into the soil. You can read what kind of a strength it has. That gives you the unconfined strength. You divide it by two, you get the shear strength. Actually, what we do is we divide this number by three to get the shear strength. In a tor vein test, we put that uh, device at the end of the sample and shear it in torsion. And read here what kind of a strength it has. Unconfined compression test. You put the soil in here and crush it. This is the proving ring. This is the deflection. We crush the soil <laughs> to see what kind of a strength it has. Unconsolidated, unconsolidated um, undrained test. Uh, in this test, you put the soil, you put the soil sample in plastic and you put hydrostatic pressure on it. You fill up the, the, the cell with water and you put the geostatic stress the same load that's on the soil, you put it on here in three-dimensional, usually give you higher strengths than unconfined. Triaxial test, that's a three-dimensional loading. You put the sample in here, you put water around it, you put three-dimensional stresses on it, and they shear it slowly. And that's how you get the shear strength for long-term parameters. We use this for slope stability analysis. This is the stress strain, cur strain curves. This deviatory stresses this is the more envelope. So for effective stress, you got a few of 22 degrees and sure strength of uh, 173 PSF. For total stress, you got 14 degrees, 10 degrees and uh, 202. Um, this is the pore pressure. Direct shear tests, uh, again, for slope stability analysis for the embankment for the bridges. This is a direct shear machine. You put the soil sample in here, usually sand. You put it in here. And, and then, of course, you put the, the cover on top of it and shear it in horizontal. It's a predetermined failure surface. And usually we use that trying to see what kind of a fee angle we get in sand. Here's a stress strain curve. This is over consolidated. This is normally consolidated soils. The strength that we use for slope stability is a residual shear strength. Gradation tests for roadway construction or soils. We get the gradation on the soil. We put them in these sieves. You run it through, it's got text up 247. For example, for base material that underneath the pavements or approaches to the bridges, 
if they're using flexible paving, asphalt paving, uh, you need base material. In this case in here, as you can see, uh, not minus 200, 20% smaller than 200. So most of this sample is coarse aggregate, coarse sand. So it's used for base material. Hydrometer tests for erosion protection, you do a hydrometer test. And uh, in this test, uh, what, what you do is the soil specimen is dispersed in water. In a dispersed state, the soil particles will settle individually in water. It's assumed that the soil particles are spheres and the velocity of the particles can be given by Stokey law. That's kind of like you disperse the soil in here and uh, you put the hydrometer in there. And from that, in calculations, you can find out what the grain size is on that soil. Is there a silt or clay? Like in here at 200, you got 50% passes uh, the uh, minus 200. This soil is sandy lean clay, minus 200, 66% passing, 200. Yeah, it's 66%. So it's a clay soil. In Texas, we have all kinds of soils. We got clay soils. This is a clay site, sandy soils. This is like you go to the beach, Galveston Beach, Corpus Christi. You know, you got all kinds of sand out there. This is a sandy site. Silt. This silt is kind of like, you know, grain size is bigger than clay, but smaller than sand. Really a bad material to build, build on. So uh, it pumps a lot when you do a pavement on it. It's not a good material. We have gravel too, parts of Texas. Gravel is good material. In parts of Houston area, for example, although we don't have rock, we do have sandstone or siltstones. And uh, really these siltstones out there occur in some places. They're very dense. Um, so we have clays, you go get orange clays, you get white clays. Below that, you get into weathered rock. And here's rock. Fill. We can build our embankment on bridges with fill. There's no problem with the fill as long as it's properly compacted. Standard proctor, 95% of standard proctor density, and there's no organics in it. Uh, we should be able to build on top of fill. If you go around Houston to want to know what kind of soils you have, if you start with where I live near Roman Forest in Spandora, we got really Sandy, silty soil over here. You go to Kingwood, it turns into gumbo clays. You go to Crosby, Highland, Channelview, Baytown, Pasadena, Seabrook, League City, Friendswood, Pearland, Missouri City, Sugarland, New Territory, Rosenberg, Pecan Grove. Highly expansive soils, really expansive soil, a lot of clays. You start going out there at I-10 West to Katy, Brookshire, uh, Fairfield, Tomball, the woodlands, the soils becomes real sandy. Although they got some clays out there in Tomball as well. You go to Condro, you got some parts of Condro, it's all sand. Some parts is highly fat clays. You go inside Houston, you just basically West University, Bel Air, Tanglewood, you got highly expansive soils with large oak trees that cause a lot of foundation problems. This is what we call shrinkage uh, cracks in, uh, in expansive soils. That's to, due to drought, the soil starts shrinking. With time, uh, these cracks get filled up with debris. And then we get a big rainfall, the cracks wants to close, and then there's no place for them to go. So the soil cracks at 45 degree angle. This is called slick sides. Okay, so if you go out there and put your piers in the ground for your bridge and you start having caving problems, that's because the slick sides are failing or you got detention ponds or channels, the side of the de 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 detention ponds that starts failing, although your soils are hard, it could be because of presence of slick sides. We've got a lot of expansive soils in Texas and Louisiana. 
Soils in Texas are variable, so make sure you do your geotechnical work uh, for your soils that you have here. This is a map that the soils that can expand up to 1,500% throughout the United States. That's U.S. Corps of Engineers map. So we got a lot of expansive soils throughout the United States. When God did the land plan for Texas, he put in Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, all in areas where he got expansive soils. Lubbock guys in El Paso, they got caliche and they got sandy soils. They got good stuff. Here, we have to deal with a lot of gumbo clay and shrink soil problems. Again, map of the expansive soils in Texas. In Houston, if you go north of Buffalo Bayou, your soils are sandy. South of Buffalo Bayou, you got gumbo clay. This is a typical boring log that we have that you can have zero to two feet. And here is a crushed limestone. Below that, you got fat gumbo clay with a PI of 64, 59, lean clay. Below that, PI of 24. Below that, you got sand. Below that, you got fat clay. And their strings are 1,000 PSF, jumps to about 2,000 PSF, drops to about 1,500, jumps up back to about uh, 3,000 PSF. So it's not a bad soil. Now, if you do a tax dot, you got to use their wind core program. And it gives you the zip on, on the soil types. This is silt. This is clay. And um, got, again, clay. This is lean clay. This is how the blow counts, 40 and 30. For six inch and six inch, so your blow count is 70. Okay, so you add these two together. You got clay from zero to, to elevation 70. And, uh, well, actually, from here, the, you got from, I guess, from 60 to about 70 depth. From 70 to 75, you got uh, brown, reddish brown silt. You know that you got gumbo clay, very stiff clay. So if you look at that, the PI is 51 here. The blow counts is, you know, like here, 18 and 14, over six inches, six inches. You know that you got lean clay, stiff to hard. The PI is 26. The unit weight is 132. And a point ninety three. Sure, strength of one point. I don't like their logs very much. But I like our logs better. One of the things about soils is not like structural engineering. Structural guys got it made. They can specify, I want 3,000 PSI at 28 days. But we got to work with the soils that's out there. So we have a lot of data points. That's why we plot the moisture content versus depth. We have high moisture, you have low strength. When you have low moisture, you have high strength. Same with density. High moisture, low density. Dry soils, they got higher density. Total unit weight. So if I want to drive some piling or put drill piers in, I want to put it over here where I have higher strength. Again, we got data points that we have to go with. This is a soil stratigraphy along a project from elevation 30 to elevation 18. You got clay. Below that, you got sand. Below that, you got clay. So if you're going to do drill piers, if you go through the sand layer, you may have caving problems. So you got to look at using slurry methods of construction. Textad uses a lot of slurry methods of construction for drill footing insulation. Pile foundations, you can have steel pipe piles. The great foundations, they usually cost money. <laughs> you can drive them into the water. You drive them with a hammer. It could be a steam hammer. It could be a diesel hammer. These are pre-stressed concrete piles. A lot of big surface area and big end bearing. So it can carry a lot of load. A great foundation system we use for bridges. These are other types of piles. You usually driving them with like a 
hammer. There's the Delmac diesel hammer. This is how we drive them in. This is the bridge in I-45 driving pre-stressed concrete piles. Here's we set it up and we start driving in with a with a hammer. This is another bridge. The engineer was Aggie, put the uh, the, the piles on an angle to take care of the lateral loads. On light loaded uh, bridges, you can use timber piles. Usually you treat this with creosote. These are the timber piles. You can have a square pile or a round pile. You drive them in with a hammer. That's a steam hammer. Or I have a diesel hammer. Pull them up. So that's what the structure looks like. You cut the top of the piles, make sure they're not cracked. That's not acceptable. Soil structural interaction on typical projects. If you have pile foundations, we use API design procedure, RP2A, we'll pile capacity curve. They've got a pretty good system in place. That's for non textile projects. So we use API method. Oh, well, API method uses F shear strength, alpha times C. Well, alpha is a dimensionless factor, C is a shear strength. That's how you calculate alpha 0.5, psi 0.5, and uh, 0.5 psi, 0.25 psi, greater than 1.0, psi is C over P ratio, shear strength over the geostatic stress. P naught is the overburden pressure. For sand, you use KP, tangent phi, tangent delta. Delta is usually like a V minus five degrees. P naught is effective stress, overburden pressure. K coefficient, we usually use 0 0.8. End bearing, we use QP, P naught times N Q, which is P naught is effective stress. Okay, the, and geostatic stress. And N, N Q is usually nine. And uh, oh no, NQ depends on the on, on the sand. It varies. For clay is nine, it just ends up C, but uh, uh, for end bearing. So that, that's the uh, uh, let's see, end bearing for clays. This is, of course, shear strength for clays. For end bearing for clays, we use 9C, nine times shear strength at the depth. It's not shown here. So here's the API table. If you got very loose sand, your friction angle is 15 degrees. Limiting skin friction is 1.0 kips per square foot. N sub Q is eight. Limiting unit end bearing value is 90 uh, KSF. For loose, for medium dense sand or silt, use a fee angle of 20. Skin friction, uh, the limiting is 1.4 KSF. N sub Q is 12. Your limiting end bearing is 60 KSF. For dense sand, P 25 degrees, 1.7 limiting skin friction. Okay, kips per square foot. N sub Q 20, 100. That's a lot of end bearing KSF. Very dense sand. 30 degrees, 2.0 skin friction, KSF, N sub Q 40, limiting unit end bearing of 200. Dense, very dense, gravel, stuff like that, fee of 30 degrees, 35 degrees, skin friction 2.4 KSF, N sub Q of 50, 250 end bearing. Text dot, you can, you can calculate the axle capacity for your piles either using Texas cone penetrometer method, which is TCP or triaxial test method using triaxial data. TAT can underestimate compression capacity of soil, secondary structure compared to the TCP method. Most projects we work on, we use TCP method. Very good Texas cone penetrometer testing. Textile has got very good relationships in here. Somebody asking where you got the API design manual. 
you can you can get an older version, Google it, and it's on the Google. The latest version, you got to go spend like two hundred dollars and get it from API. But it's really a good document. Uh, I, I got a lot of good information in it. If you want to do pile foundations or drill piers, you know it's a good found a good manual to read. So, Texas comb penetrometer, low counts in here. Okay, this is for clays and all that skin friction. Where values of the TCP are softer than 100 blows per 12 inches. So if your bowl count is 50 for 12 inches, you go here for clay soils, you get a skin friction value of uh, 0.65. So you take that and you multiply point by 0.7 if you want to use it for drill pier. This value is for piling, okay? And it's got a factor of safety of two already in the skin friction. Use factor reduction factor of 0 0.7 for drill piers due to sample disturbance. There's no reduction factor for driven piles. As you're driving it, there's really, you remold the soil as you drive the pile in. And so actually the skin friction is higher for pile than drill piers. Well, Texas comb penetrometer for blows uh, per, you know, this is for uh, where you got the, the values are softer than 100 blows per 12 inches. It's allowable end bearing, okay, not skin friction. So if your blows are 50 and you got, uh, you know, sandy clay or clay, you got a, the end bearing of three TSF. It's got a factor of safety of two for driven piles. It's the same for, for piers. Axle capacity, point capa bearing capacity, end bearing for piles of, for less than 24 inches are neg neglected due to small area. So TxDOT doesn't count on end bearing for small piles. Point bearing capacity is considered for all drill piers. For drill piers are considerate. Maximum allowable pile service loads. If you're using a 16 inch pile, you can have a maximum length of 85 feet. For abutment, you can use 75 tons. For footings, 125 tons capacity. For 18 inch, 95. Maximum length, 90 tons, 175 tons footing per pile. For 20 inch, 105 feet maximum length, 110 tons and 225 tons for footing loading. 24 inch, 125, 140, and 300 tons. Disregard the depth of skin friction, five foot over non-water crossing. So if you put it on a flat ground, you disregard top five feet. On a lot of projects, we discard, disregard top 10 feet. If you're going on a stream crossing, you disregard top 10 feet. For abutments, you disregard the portion of the foundation passing through the fill. So here, you, TxDOT says, uh, disregard top five feet from here to here, you know, bottom five feet into the soil, you disregard it. If you go on a water crossing, all the skin friction from here to here is gonna be disregarded. Because you're in a fill, plus you got a slope in here. So I don't count on skin friction from here to here. Like I won't count on skin friction from here to here because you're in the fill. Here's a typical capacity curve, unit skin friction. Uh, uh, basically, uh, this is a skin friction here. This is the end bearing using the TCP method. Unit frictionless, and here's the cumulative friction. So, this is the textile method wind core. This is the uh, capacity only on skin friction. Okay, so that's a bridge retaining wall. And this is the capacity. And you can, if you count, count the end bearing, your capacity will go up. 
This is with point bearing, but this is without point bearing. No end bearing here. You got end bearing here. Here's some uh, power capacity curves, compression, tension. Tension, you don't count on the end bearing. And usually capacity and tension is, you got a factor of 0.7 to the compression. At 30 feet, your tension, your compression is almost uh, 75 kips. Your tension is about 60 kips. Okay. Well, we got a question here. How do you account for scour? Textile has got a procedure for uh, evaluation of the scour. I'm going to try to talk about it a little bit at the end of the program. So you basically disregard, like they say, for typical streams, you disregard top 10 feet. That's how you account for the scour. But there's actually a procedure for scour evaluation. These are deep piles, about 400 feet deep. These are offshore piles. You can come over here. You can see hit the sand layer. Then you go clay there. You hit another sand layer. You go to clay. If you want to tip a pile, you put in the sand layer here. 250 feet gives you a lot of capacity of almost 4,000 tons. Again, this is ultimate capacity. This is a, a, a recommended. You got a factor of safety of 1.5. These are what we call ENF factors, skin friction versus end bearing. So you can use any size piles, you can use this. So if you got a pile diameter of 18 inches, your parameter is, perimeter is 4.7 feet. Your area is 1.77. So compression capacity is 4.7, which is perimeter times the end bearing. This is at um, driven pile, depth of 30 feet. Your skin friction is right there. It's about six point something. KSF, your end bearing is about four KSF or so. So you got 4.7 times 6.14 plus 1.7, 7 times 4. So you got compression capacity of 36 kips. And um, with the uplift capacity and tension, you multiply by 0. 0.7. And that's 20 kips for uplift loading. I think uh, the question is the axle capacity using wind core follows ASD, not uh, LF, uh, LRFD. I don't think it does that. Here's another one here. You got a skin friction versus end bearing. You hit a sand layer here. You see the end bearing kicking up. Actually, it's probably a stiff clay. So you got an 18-inch pile. The pile is 30 feet deep. At 30, you got a skin friction of about 3.5 or so, 3.7 KSF. Your end bearing is about 2.79. So you calculate, you get the, uh, in, uh, the total capacity of 22.4. You multiply it by 0. 0.7, you get 12.2 uplift. How do you spell wing core? Um, w i n c o r e. Oh, here's a kind of a. I'll show you a. Let's see if I can show you a wind core calculation. Um, we have a wind core calculation, and if you look at it in here. Here it says wind core, W-I-N-C-O-R-E. Of 
for lateral load at the capacity here, we use uh, PY curves. So we use Alpile software for lateral loaded structures. So I've got another question. Um, so when you have a bridge foundation, you're subject to TZ curves, that's load settlement calculation, lateral PY curves, and torsional, that's the tau theta curves. That's a three-dimensional pile interaction. This is for torsion. This is for lateral loading. This is for axle loading. Question, uh, can I design drill shafts using softer shaft from InSoft or similar soft that need to be designed using textile project? If you were on a textile project, you got to use textile to CP method. I use textile for the you know, capacity. It got very good correlations. But if I'm using a project for Williamson County or I'm doing it for you know, Harris County, I use API. And you can use other methods, they're all similar. This is that stuff that you get for uh, Alpile. You get the soil types here, sandy lean clay, range from zero to two feet, uh, soil modulus of 80 K PCI, E50, that's uh, strength at 50% uh, of the strain, effective unit weight, 60 PS PCF, shear sure strength, 600 PSF. If you go to sand, this is a silt in here. You got a soil modulus K of 20. Uh, effective unit weight, 70. V angle of 28 degrees. You put that in L pile, it gives you lateral capacity. Typically you wanna limit your deflection at the top to half an inch to an inch. TZ curves, if you wanna know load settlement characteristics of a pile, you use load uh, TZ curve. This is a movement of the pile as a result of movement. Uh, this is movement. This is F over F, F max. That's the maximum skin friction over the actual mobilized skin friction. So if your mobilize is 0 0.5 over the max, that's this point. When you get to the max, that's what the curve looks like. This is the end bearing movement of the pile. And then you got the end bearing mobilized. So you can see the capacity curves. This is the actual. And that's you use TZ curves to get the salt load settlement calculations. Negative skin friction. If you got a bridge project that you're driving piles, for example, or drill piers, and uh, they got a sand layer that you pull, you, you know, tip them in, and you're putting fill on top of the site then you may get negative skin friction. When soft soils is, is around by a pile, around the pile settles, it will cause a downward movement of the soil against the pile skin called negative skin friction, down drag. There should be at least one or to two inches of settlement before negative skin friction occurs. For negative skin friction to occur, you should have Cohesive soils over cohesionless soils deposit, plus fill over compressible cohesive soils, lowering groundwater with resulting groundwater subsidence. For negative skin friction to occur, a portion of the pile should be tipped or fixed against vertical movement. If the entire pile moves down, down then there's no negative skin friction. The way you calculate negative skin friction or down drag is using beta, beta method. The skin friction, negative uh, skin friction is F sub S is equal to beta times uh, geostatic stress. So beta is 0 0.2 to 0.25 for clays, for silts is 0.25 to 3.5, for sands is 0.35 to 0.5. The load F of S is equal to F of S small, the skin friction times parameter times the thickness of the layer. 
This gamma here is, is the effective stress, geostatic stress. F is the, of course, negative skin friction, load. Group effects. Question, does WinCore provide tip settlement values for drill shafts? No, they don't. You got to calculate that. I usually use uh, Poulos method using elastic procedures to calculate the settlement. Unless you got a whole bunch of piles together then you treat it like a mat and you calculate settlement. But in general, I use elastic Poulos and Davis method to calculate settlements of piles. Okay, it's kind of like, you know, crude, you know, efficiency factor for piles. If you got a pile group in here, three by three piles or nine by nine piles, if you put them three, three, three diameters apart, here it says you're at 0.75%. Basically, TxDOT says, as long as your piles are three diameters apart, you got a 100% contribution for axle capacity. If they're very close together, you lose that capacity. You treat the whole thing as a block with the end bearing at the end. It's not very effective. You'd like to put at least your piles three diameter apart. Pile driving, you, you drive the piles with steel hammer or, or you know diesel hammer or actual weights. This is Galveston driving some piles in the ground there. That's a pile driving in one of those third world countries. Pile driving text dot specification is text dot spec 404. Refusal is 0.1 sub penetration per blow or 124 blows per foot. If you can't drive your piles to the design tip, you can do a pilot hole, which is four inches less than the diagonal of the square pile one inch less than diameter of a round pile. Or you can do jetting, create a hole by doing a 22.5 inch diameter pipe, 150 PSI, you create a hole, you put your pile in there and start driving in. Drive a minimum of one foot below the tip elevation, 100 blows per foot. That's 100 blows of TCP per foot. The size of the uh, driving equipment, that you use, if you're driving a timber pile, uh, you need a minimum, you know, maximum ram stroke of five feet, round weight 2,000 pounds, or air hydraulic type hammer. If you go diesel, you can use a round weight of 2,000 pounds and stroke of 10 feet and 330, that's the energy, times R. R is the design load is in tons. So, I'm doing a timber pile. I got a, let's say I've got a 20 ton pile times 330. So you got 20 tons times 330. That's a foot pound of the hammer that you that you're going to need for this project. You're driving steel piles using air or hydraulic. You're going to have to have a ram of about 3,000 pounds, five stroke maximum stroke of five feet. For diesel is 2,000 maximum stroke of 10 feet. And uh, larger of 250 times R, which is the design load, or 2.5 times WP, which is weights in pounds uh, 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 of basically of the pile. For concrete, the same thing. Ram is 3,000 uh, pounds, but not less than one fourth of a pile weight of the weight of the pile. But these are 2,700. Minimum, but not less than one fourth of the weight of the pile. 
the stroke is, is five foot maximum. We're using air for diesel is eight foot. And you know, the energy that you need is 250 R or but not less than uh, one per foot, one foot pound per pound of pile weight. So that's kind of gives you an idea what, what kind of hammer energy that you're going to need. Hammer formula, use hammer formulas to get the capacity of the pile at the time of driving. Basically, it depends on hammer type, ram weight, stroke, and blow counts. Pile set up and freeze. When you drop piles like in clays, it can gain strength over time. When you drive the pile, it's got dynamic capacity. So maybe it's 50 kips. But as you because, because of the high pore pressure, that load is high, is low. But with time, the pore pressure this dissipates in the pile. And pile, pile gets gained strength. Usually uh, for cohesive soils, you can assume a 2.0 factor from a dynamic capacity to a static capacity. For sands, it doesn't matter. The static capacity and dynamic capacities are the same. So this is the pile driving in clays. Starts over here. With time, the pile starts gaining strength. This Q final over Q initial. Final load over the initial load at the time of driving. And pile starts gaining strength with time. That's what I see most of the time. Pile, also, you can see what's called pile rel rel relaxation. Piles can lose strength over driving certain soils like very dense sand or inorganic silt or stiff fissured clays, they can actually lose the strength it's called relaxation. So it's usually seen in end bearing piles. The other thing you can see is uh, in terms of uh, power relaxation, if you go on a project where you got power relaxation, that means you have low strength on your pile capacity, you may have to drive your piles deeper to get the design capacity. So you may have to go down another 20 feet or 15 feet to get the design capacity. Pile heave. Okay, like where we had Eastern ship channel, lots of soft clays, high pore pressures. You drop one pile, the other pile starts kicking up. It's called pile heave. This is because a high pore pressure built up during driving in clay soils. And then that starts pushing up the soil up. And if you got piles here, it's going to lift that pile up. So you have to go back and retap the piles that are coming up and uh, get them down to elevation. A lot of times what we find that if the, if the piles are heaving, uh, you can just cut the tops and uh, it still carries the load capacity that you're looking for. So you can cut some of the tops if they're sticking out. Dynamic pile load test. This is a bridge in Conroe, Texas. Pre-stressed concrete piles. The contractor could dr drive some of these piles to the tip elevation. So we want to know what kind of capacity they have using dynamic cap WAP methods. The pile monitoring system it gives you pile stresses, pile integrity, hammer performance, capacity at the time of testing. You put an accelerometer and strain gauge. On the pile, you connect it to the machine. Here's an accelerometer and it's a strain gauge. You put it on both sides of the pile. And you start driving the pile into the ground. That gives you dynamic capacity, capacity at the time of pile driving. You can read it on this device here. So on this project, Shaft resistance was 365 kips. And the total resistance in bearing was 120 with 500 kips essentially total capacity. So it met our uh, loading carrying capacity. So we cut the top of the piles. We didn't drive them to design depth. But you got to do that to prove that you have enough capacity before you cut the top of the pile. Otherwise, you got to have to drive them to the design depth. That means you have to have a proper hammer pile 
match to, to drive it to the design depth. Static power capacity load test. Here's where you set your frames. You put dial gauges and start loading the, the pile and measuring load settlement, you know, performance. As you put add load, more lead to it, load to it, it settles. You got, this is a Texas quick load test. Here's a typical pile, capacity versus time. The way you calculate design load, you use either double tangent method or plunging failure method. Okay, so this thing, you know, plunging failure method, you take that uh, ultimate load divided by 2.3. For plunging failure method, take the plunging failure load divided by 2.3. This is the plunging failure load. This is the load settlement for a pile. The settlement in inches, 0.6 inch, 0.7 inch, 0.8 inch. You start loading the pile, starts going down. This is the plunging failure. You put a slope here and a slope in here. That's the ultimate capacity divided by 2.0. And that gives you the safe capacity. Now, if you want to use uh Plunging failure method, you take that load divided by 2.3, this load here. There's a slope to this line in here. Uh, the point of the slope gross settlement line, 0 0.05 inch per ton. And you come with a slope in here. This is the design load, the ultimate capacity, divided by two to get the safe capacity. In this case, K factor, which is the uh, actual, uh, basically uh, the load capacity of 63 tons by calculated method of 42.3. So you get a K factor of 1.5 that you use on a project. So you do a load test. And if you know your actual load carrying capacity is 1.5 times of the calculated design, you can use that for all your piles on the project. Here's again, drill shaft capacity. You, you, here's a plunging failure load. You run a slope like this in here. Slope of 0 .0, 0 0 0.01 inch per ton. The last segment increment of load. You come with a slope of here, a tangent. This is your design load you divided by two. You get 370 tons is your design load. This is a plunging load. You can take this load divided by 2.3. It's another method to calculate capacity. So we got K factor is L over P is the maximum shaft from a load test. P is calculated or from hammer formula capacity. So that's your K factor. Drill pier foundations. We use drill piers all over Texas for bridges. Textile really likes them. This is a casing to prevent caving problems. And you can see the cage on the drill shafts. You drill out there with an auger. Here it is. Of course, you drill it and you put the steel cage in it. You drill it, put in a steel cage. Or you can, you know, these are the drill shafts in here. You bump concrete from bottom up. The unit weight of the concrete is uh, 150 PCF. If there is uh, any kind of a slurring, usually about 80 PCF. 75, so it removes the, the, the slurry as the concrete comes up. But you put the concrete with the trimming method all the way from bottom up. 
We use drill shaft design manual for drill shaft design for you know non-textile projects. Okay. The axle capacity for textile wing core program. And you can see the skin friction cumulatively. Here's the end bearing. Oh, this is a uh, skin friction again, Fort Bend County Parkway project. This is drill shaft, skin friction versus end bearing. Here's another drill shaft, skin friction, end bearing. Again, here's drill shaft with end bearing. This is the drill shaft without the end bearing. Textile does not use bell on their bridge piers. This is the ENF factor for piers. This is the skin friction. This is the end bearing. For a drill shaft. TAT method using triaxial tests, using uh, unconfined compression or UU test to get the skin friction. Uh, this pile is, is the diameter is 24 inches, perimeter is 6.28 feet, area is 3.14, dual footing, depth 30 feet. That's your skin friction of three. Your end bearing is. I don't know, 2.0, 1.5, or whatever. So QC is 6.28 times 2.9 skin friction plus area of 3.14 times 1.5 is the, the end bearing at the depth of 30 feet. For tension, you take that value multiplied by 0.7. Okay. Here's again skin friction versus end bearing. Dual footing, this is a straight shaft, 24 inches, parameter 6.28, area 3.4, QC is 4.5 kips, QT is 0.7 times that, minus end bearing is 26 kips. Allowable drill shaft surface loads. 24 inch, 175 tons, 30 inch, 375 tons, 36 inch, 400 tons, all the way to 120 inch, which is gonna put 4,400 tons of load carrying for drill shafts. Textile uses, does not use bells for, for bridge foundations. You drill a hole for out there for the bridge. This is the auger rig, you drill the hole. An auger rig. You go a straight shaft for these bridges. This is the reamer if you want to have a bell. You go drill the shaft. You can have up to about three inches of water in it. This is dry method of construction. You measure the depth. Check with the hand penetrometer to see what kind of strength you have. This is the hand penetrometer values. This is the bell, you measure the right size bell you have. Sometimes it doesn't open up properly, so make sure you got the proper bell size. This is the bell tool to make sure you got the proper bell size. You sweep it in the hole to make sure the contractor actually build the bell like it's supposed to. This is the cage. This is how you put the cage in. You pour concrete, make sure it doesn't hit the sides doesn't hit the sides. Use trimmy to put the concrete in from bottom up. It's a funnel. This is how the pier looks like. For dry method of construction, you drill a hole, you put your cage in, you put concrete from bottom up. If your soils are sandy and I got caving problems with no groundwater problems, you can use casing method of construction. You drill a pilot hole, you put your casing in, 
Here's the casing. Here's the casing. You drill the hole, you get to the design depth. And uh, again, here's the casing. You drill the hole, check with the hand penetrometer to see you got the proper strength. You bell it here. Take the reamer out, you put the cage in. You put the concrete in from bottom up. Or you're trimming the concrete with the, you know, from bottom up. You pull your casing out. So in sandy soils where you have caving problems, you do your pilot hole, you drill through the sand, <clears throat> put the casing in there, you push it in. You put in your bell, put in concrete, and as you do that, you pull the casing out. What textile uses is what's called slurry method of construction. Uh, they drill the hole, they use drilling mud, bentonite, to keep the hole. The bentonite's got lateral pressures, keeps the sand in place. Also, cakes over the sand uh, and, and prevents it from caving. This is the mud pit. Bentonite pit, you drill the hole, you put your cage in, you drill with, the, of course, uh, bentonite. The bentonite sticks to the sand layer, kind of cakes in there. The hydrostatic pressure keeps the hole from caving. Reduction in skin infection factor is 0.7 um, for. Uh, with drill piers, both casing and slurry method of construction. Again, you're drilling the hole here, putting the concrete in within trimming from bottom up. This is a slurry method. It replaces the, the, the slurry as you uh, concrete comes up. The slurry method of construction, you drill the hole with the slurry, keeps the hole open. You put your cage in, you put the concrete in from bottom up. You got a sump in here, slurry goes in there, and you recycle the slurry on the next, next board, next drill piers. All right, uh, David, we're, we're kind of in our QA uh, uh, budgeted time for another nine minutes. Um, if you have additional questions or David, if you want to do, if there are no questions, you can do a little wrap up. Uh, that'd be okay, let me, I got nine minutes. Let me cut on okay. try to get close to the, uh, another All pot right. uses auger cast piles. These are auger cast. You, they're, they're basically, uh, like augers. They got a hole in the middle of them. Like that you drill them, the spoils come up. This is the hole you shoot the grout through it. These are typical auger cast piles. Textile is using them on some projects. You drill the hole with the grout. I mean, you drill the hole, you put in the grout, you pull out your augers, and then you push the casing, uh, the, the cage in there. That's the cage in, in the grout for auger cast piles. Or you put your steel in there. A lot of times they just, on small ones, they use it like a number one number 10 bars for tension. These are pipe bridges that use pre-stressed concrete piles. Where you can use timber piles. Scour, somebody asked, one of the things geotechs give you on scour is D50, diameter at 50% of the finer grain size. You get that from the grain size. That's a D50 diameter. That 50% passes. In this case, 60% passes number 200. And here is the D50 here, right there. D50 should be within the upper 15 feet of the channel, slope, surface, or floor line of a bridge abutment or interior location. Should be CAGA. So don't go use D50 for 50 feet down. Got to be top 15 feet. This is a He's the uh, textile project. That's the ship, the San Jacinto River Bridge out there in Houston. It got flooded in, in 2017. 
and uh, the water was flowing this way. And if you look at the bends on this thing, I'm going fast here you know, because we're running out of time. Uh, you do sonar, you can see the bend 14, there was no scour. Uh, you look at bend 16, there was 25 foot of scour. Bend 17, 25 foot of scour. So they had to go out there and jackhammer part of the bridge, go in there putting new drill shafts deeper to account for a scour. Scour types are local, which is steep sided scour pits around the single pile or global dispersive scour, shallow white depression under around the individual installation, overhead seabed movements. You don't have to worry about that one. Okay, rocks, clays, and sands. For rocks, you don't worry about, you know, scour if there are blow counts for TCP is less than four inch per 100 blows. If the rock is soft, 12 inch per 100 blows, is mildly susceptible to scour. If there are clays with blow counts of 12 inch over 100, mildly susceptible. If there are 12 inch over 100 blows, they're susceptible to a to moderate scour. Sands are very susceptible to scour. You can put these guards in here, like aromatic type hard armor around these things. You can put riprap around your piles to reduce the scour. On your bridge projects or embankment, you got to do a slope stability analysis because the slopes under the bridge and the sides can fail. You can see the failure in here. So you got to do slope stability. That's a whole new program, another program that I will go over about slope stability analysis, about my failures. And here's a few pictures of Houston Sheep Channel Bridge. Thanks to h and for construction management. And this is a great bridge project. So you pump the concrete in and you can see how it's going. It's a billion dollar project. A lot of concrete, a lot of steel. The interesting part about this thing is uh, the large diameter piers that they used in here. Some of these piers are eight foot in diameter at the bents. You can see the auger in here. These are huge. They use casing for caving problems, water, big uh, cages. This is an abutment, a lot of piers, any drill piers in there. So that's it. I got five minutes left. So any questions uh, you have, uh, if you got projects, uh, pictures of the bridges, please send them to me. Uh, you can see this presentation on YouTube. You go to Geotech Engineering and Testing, your YouTube channel. This is the program evaluation. Y'all tell me how'd you like the program? All right, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, we do have uh, four or five minutes left for a couple of questions. If there are any, you've been doing a good job uh, addressing them along the way, right? Yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead so, and ask me here. I don't see program evaluation thing here. Let's see. Uh, I don't see that. Okay, here we go. Here's a session feedback in here. So please fill that out. If you need to reach me, my email is de at geotechieng.com. My number is 713-699-4000. And, uh, uh oh, something happened here. David, I'm going to see no other questions. I have one of my own. Um, yeah. you know, I've, I've worked and collaborated with, with many geotechs over my career. Um, uh, and uh, but some of the stuff that you present is certainly a good refresher for me. Uh, the uh, on the on the I've, I've already been always been curious about this on, on the uh, particle size distribution. Uh, uh, clear clearly using the hydro the hydrometer method for that in Stokes law uh, for the cohesive for the co cohesive parts of the soil profile. Uh, does that all? Do you also do kind of a a, a wet uh, sieve analysis on the same on the same material? Yeah, the yeah. We, the way we do is we take a sample and we run hydrometers, 
course, that indicates the stuff uh, smaller than minus 200 on the right. stuff above the 200, we use sieve analysis. But stuff smaller than uh, smaller 200? 200, use hydrometer. Hydrometer only? Okay. Yeah. Because it's just not practical, I guess, to do the sieve analysis on, on stuff under two, 200. Um, uh, no, that's so small. That it sieves do do you, small. have there been any, you know, I imagine there have been because geotech is such a mature field, but are there, uh, how does, are, are there any, you know, research base that shows, uh, you know, what, what accuracy you have in the hydrometer test uh, uh, compared to some kind of a, a laboratory sieve analysis, if it could be performed, what they, in other words, the, the error introduced by using Stokes law and the, you know, the assumption of, of spherical, uh, spherical shape of the, of the particle. I don't think you can run some analysis on stuff less than 200. Well, that was kind of my question. That's a limit. I mean, you can use yeah. the, and you, you so have to use hydrometer. Are, have there been any academic studies that, that show that the hydrometer study are, are accurate to some, to some degree? I imagine that, that, that they are, but. Um, I think they're, they're accurate and uh, to the best of our technology. I guess there is, may be other methods to use. I'm not aware of any other methods on typical projects that, that, that we do. We, we use but it, it's, it's really, and hydrometer. Yeah, but it's a calculated, it's a calculated value based on Stokes Law, as you explained very yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting, David. Um, okay, go ahead. There's another question here. Oh, they're excellent. Spacing, yeah. They're spacing that the peers are pretty standard depending on soil type, determine the length and width of the design structure. Yeah, I think uh, if you are three pile diameters, you're okay. You got to basically, a three pile, pile diameter, you got an efficiency value of uh, 1.0. If you start getting closer, you can use Poulos and Davis elastic methods. They're very good to evaluate the uh, uh, the capacity reduction. There's a software that these guys developed called DefPig, and uh, that one uh, you can use that uh, to calculate the group effects and multiple. If you want to get fancy about it, okay. Any other question? All right. Uh, thank you, David. No, if there's probably out of time here for questions, but you can directly uh, contact David. Uh, David, I, I want to thank you again, uh, you know, for participating. Uh, thank you for you all, uh, all the attendees participating in today's ASCE section technical, Texas section technical webinar. Uh, thank you again, David. And, 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 uh, and your company, Geotech Engineering and Testing. As mentioned before, individual registrants will receive a certificate of attendance without further action. In other words, you don't need to do anything. You'll get your PDF H certificate in a few days. Um, if you are interested in presenting a Texas section webinar, please email bptech, bptech, at texasasce.org for more information. You can also go to the webinars page of the Texas section website for a list of upcoming sessions. So we're always available for your questions and, and David will be too down the road. And I, I hope to hear from, from all of you soon. Mike, uh, I'm gonna turn this back over to you to end the session. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, thank you, Mark. And thanks once again to everybody for joining us today. I'm going to Hang on for just another minute or so while this poll, just to make sure everybody's done, and then we will uh, wrap up the session. So feel free to log off if you've already done the poll. <laughs>